So games of skill like draw poker are allowed, but games of luck like slot machines are not. Again, just to reiterate the difference, card rooms are illegal in LA City, but there are still plenty that are legal or at the very least tolerated in many of the surrounding cities back then. This right, right, yes. So there were dozens of card rooms in places like Hawthorne, Compton, and Monterey Park. Mm -hmm. Long Beach alone had 40 of these card wow, rooms. Wow, really? Whether these places were licensed or unlicensed varied, but they were there and they were allowed to operate. Okay. But then in 1937, if you were a gambler, the darkest thing happened to you since everything else that probably happened to you in the 30s that made you a compulsive gambler. The state attorney general of California deemed games of chance to be illegal. Oh, I'm a game of chance. <laughs> this whole life is but a life game is of chance. A game. <laughs> so what? Is life no longer legal? No, just craps. <laughs> is craps not life? <laughs> Heart eight. This basically was targeted directly at the card rooms that were technically legal in California that were playing draw poker. And while this went against the stipulation that is in the Constitution of California that draw poker is legal, it freaked out all the card rooms operating in those places I just mentioned. So they either closed down completely or they fled out of state. Okay. Yet another weird legal nether region. Like it, same with yours, is it international waters? Right. Like it, it just was not entirely clear. But one, one guy named Ernie Prim, who uh, was running a card room in another little neighboring city of LA called Gardena. Ah. Uh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> the sound that goes through your head whenever you hear those two syllables. <laughs> no, three. Oh. I ain't counting. Prim was a Texan who had come to California in the early 30s. And in 1936, he had opened up a card room in Gardena called the Embassy Palace. But when that new ruling came out in 1937, Prim decided, I came all the way from Texas to open this dump. And if I have to slink back there with my tail between my legs, they'll put a cowboy hat on me so big, it'll drag me six feet under in shame. So he kept his card room open. And of course, on June 2nd, 1937, he was raided and shut down. Okay. However, he took the case to court, arguing that it was drawn draw poker and that the state constitution explicitly allowed draw poker. So he won the case and uh -huh. he was able to reopen his card room. So what this did was it set the precedent in court that card rooms were legal and Gardena decided this is our thing. Yeah. We're just going to run with run, this. Yeah. <laughs> we have no natural resources except money. There are no restaurants in Gardena, only card rooms. There are no uh, stores that sell televisions because it's the 30s, but also because it's a card room. This is one of those things where you make a joke, Greg. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. We'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to how unfunny what you just said was. <laughs> You usually do. Just like our post-show meetings, I will tell you why everything you said <laughs> was not funny. They saw that all the card rooms in the surrounding cities closed or moved away after the 1937 thing. So by fully embracing them, Gardena could make a name for themselves and more importantly, make some money for money. themselves. Gardena set up strict rules for the card rooms. There was no drinking. Maximum bets could only be one or two dollars. Husbands and wives weren't allowed to play together so that they couldn't like oh, have right. a scheme of, of like, when I tug on my yeah. wedding ring, that, yeah. that's well, how you know. When I scream at you for folding my uh, the bed sheets wrong, <laughs> that's how I let you know that I have two aces in the pocket. <laughs> when I point out to you that there's lipstick on your collar that's not my color, that's how you know that I'm just having fun here. When I say that I never meant I do and I were. <laughs> ever meeting you, that means all in, baby. Just like I did on X. So it was 50 cents an hour to sit at one of the tables and the city of Gardena profited off all of this with a $50 tax per table of okay. these rooms. So for a few years, Prim's Embassy Palace was the only big room in town, but in 1940, the Western Club opened, which in 1947 was bought by a former bouncer who worked for Prim named Russ Miller, who renamed it the Normandy Club and later the famous Normandy Casino. Oh, wow. Okay. Which was We'll get into what that became, but that, yeah. this place was legendary in Gardena, which is a weird sentence to say. I'm a legend of Gardena. <laughs> Post-World War, the one where gamblers were turned into bullets, Gardena was the only city in LA County that offered licensed poker. So by 1951, Gardena had five card rooms that were capped at 36 tables per place, most of which were along Vermont Avenue. Okay. By the 60s, there were six card rooms operating in Gardena. There was the Embassy, the Rainbow, and the Monterey, all three of which were owned by Prim. And mm -hmm. then there was the Normandy, the Gardena, and the Horseshoe. It was so bustling with poker and not quite gambling that Prim got Gardena to declare itself the poker capital of California. Nice. But how did Prim get the political clout to convince the city of Gardena to do that, you might ask? Mm -hmm. Would you ask me that? Greg, how did he get the that? political clout enough to get the people of Gardena to... Greg. Thank you for asking me You're that. Welcome. And I will tell you afterwards why you were right to ask me <laughs> that. First, you get the money. Right. Then you get the power. 
then you get the baby in the baby carriage or whatever that <laughs> saying goes. By 1952, over a third of Gardena's revenue was coming from the card rooms. Oh, and who geez. was in control of most of the card rooms? Ernie Prim. So again, it was the same thing of like, you can follow the money. Yeah. That's what the guy in the parking lot told me. <laughs> he had some sort of a throat condition, but <laughs> follow the money. And as they say in Gardena, never go against the hand that feeds you stonad. <laughs> With all this money coming in, thanks to them, Prim and the other card room owners basically ran Gardena. Okay. Like it's just a smaller scale of what was going on in Los Angeles okay. city. It's, so he's paying them off anybody who would question. He's more than here. I'll tell you what he's paying. They controlled the decision making of the city council because in a way they were the ones paying their salary. So it was in their best interest of the city council to one, keep that gravy train flowing and yeah. two, keep these guys happy because they could three, have them replaced or four, something even worse, which we'll get into in a little bit. Okay. So they maintain this power in many ways, none of them respectable. They discouraged development inside of Gardena because they were afraid that any new businesses other than card rooms would get to a point where they were so successful that they could take the power over the city council away from the gambling guys. Right. So gambling stayed the only industry in Gardena. Jeez. Like they convinced the city council, like, no, you can't build a mall here. Yeah. What if the guy who owns JC Penny becomes really <laughs> Okay, you're going to open a gimbals here. What kind of car? Do you, so where are you going to put the poker tables? <laughs> what if this radio shack becomes really powerful? <laughs> Here's where your joke, here's where I deflate your jokes. They <laughs> kept high quality restaurants outside of Gardena because they wanted people coming into their card rooms, restaurants, which sold food that was pretty good for cheap because it brought in new gamblers. Oh, that geez. was a way to get people okay. like, oh, this hamburger is pretty good. Is that draw poker? Yeah. Uh, can I lose the money in that room over there? <laughs> they kept the population of Gardena low so that the number of voters was kept at a level that they could control to make sure that the people Jeez. they wanted to be elected got the job. Okay. So there was population. They weren't like, you know, it wasn't like eugenics, but they were, they were, they were like making sure like only this many people can live in Gardena because right. otherwise I can't control all of them. Every fifth child has to move to another city. Yeah. There was a strict two child policy <laughs> in Gardena. In the 30s. <laughs> Their influence even stretched outside Gardena city limits by making sure none of the surrounding cities started opening up card rooms of their own that would draw away business from their card rooms. Right. So these were all your classic political manipulations they used to maintain control, but then they also had more manipulative ways ways as well. They would do things that seemed nice and like they cared for the community, but there was always more to it. They would pay for local kids to go to Disneyland. They helped this was yeah. even before Disneyland existed. <laughs> it was just Walt Disney's house. You want to go to his house? <laughs> then Los Feliz. We're going to a cornfield in Anaheim. <laughs> the happiest place on earth. Can I ride the corn? <laughs> they helped found the local YMCA. They gave to local charities and the local Japanese Cultural Institute. They gave food to families in need during Christmas. They they worked with families whose members were had gambling addictions to yeah. get those family members banned from the Jesus. clubs. All nice stuff yeah. that was done to curry favor with the community so that they would have a positive view of them in their eyes when elections came up regarding the card rooms or regarding people who the people in the card rooms told them to vote for. Okay. So this was all like, oh, no, I don't want the card rooms to become illegal. They bought me a turkey right. last December. Yeah. They sent my kids to the cornfield, <laughs> which, which means a different thing in the 50s. <laughs> they got local social clubs to be title holders in the card Jesus. room so that they felt invested to protect them from political opposition of their own volition. They're really like locking themselves in, they, in it, every single corner they can find. Yeah, it's their, their roots, Greg, yeah. the roots. The roots. <laughs> they even got bankers, a lot of bankers, invested in the profits of the room so that the banks would do whatever they could to help them stay open oh, and wow. keep making them personally Jeez, money. The foundation on this thing is pretty strong. Every single, like it could not, fa too yeah. big to fail. Prim and the other owners tried to protect the image of Gardena that while there was kind of gambling going on here, it was still a clean and safe place to right. come to. There's no Tommy guns, let's say. There, yeah, There's there, no, uh, all of the murders happen when you're Baxter. <laughs> it was not that sort of place yeah. that they wanted to look like. It brought a ton of money to the town. Yes, but it was a deal with the devil because it brought all the corruption I just mentioned, but also just good old fashioned mobster violence yeah, came yeah, yeah. to Gardena. Prim himself wasn't necessarily a gangster, but he had a lot of ties and a lot of mob like things happened in and around his card rooms. Mm -hmm. Tony Cornero, he had a room in Gardena at a certain point, apparently. Yeah. The Horseshoe Club was originally owned by the Ver Kranz Corporation, which was a confirmed mob owned entity. <laughs> there was a lot of cheating happening in these rooms that the staff would accept money to look the other way on. There mm -hmm. were armed robberies of the high stakes games 
Uh, some winners would walk outside and get immediately mugged. A few people got murdered. Jeez, this is like you're just, you could easily be describing the 1880s, like the Old West. And this is Gardena in like 1952. <laughs> Red Dead Redemption Gardena. <laughs> the bars surrounding the card rooms were run by a guy named Shushine Nick. Mm -hmm. And when you'd go in there after losing it all, there was always somebody in there willing to give you a loan to okay. get right back Jesus. into the card rooms. There were gamblers around with names like Pete the Thief, <laughs> Dirty Mouth Paula, Ronnie the Mooch, Loudmouth George, Benny the Bandit, Cliff the Lover, and the Yule Brinner of Vermont Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> he was just bald, I bet. I bet you he was just bald. He didn't even go to the card rooms. It was just a bald man that walked through town one day. Yeah, he's a legend. <laughs> I'm trying to get to Bell. <laughs> You're crazy. The stuff you say is crazy. <laughs> but it was like Yule Brinner from, um, from uh, Westworld. Westworld, and he's just in a black. <laughs> he, he won't stop walking. So it was pretty sleazy all around, which is why there was so much opposition to them. The first move in to get them closed was in 1946, fueled by all the organized crime that was going on and the power the owners had over the city. That one failed, mm -hmm. but people just kept trying and trying and trying. And it seemed both sides were capable of violence because at 1.30 a.m. on December 11th, 1950, Sam Rummel, who was the lawyer representing the card rooms and all these lawsuits, was shot in the neck with a double-barreled oh shotgun God. in front of his house at 2600 Laurel Canyon. If you get shot in the neck with a shotgun... You don't have a neck. Anymore. You don't have... They shot your neck off. That's the there kind was of an thing. entry wound uh, around the entire neck. <laughs> His neck was an entry wound. This could have been a coincidence, though, because he was also the lawyer of Tony Cornero. Oh, geez. And he worked with Mickey Cohen, so it might have been related to a different aspect of what his are you, mob work. What are you shooting me about? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, in 1954, the Civic Improvement Committee formed out of 13 local churches to try to get the card rooms banned. They failed. No, the but, church groups <laughs> failed? No. But things really boiled over in the late 50s when Prim proposed the idea of building a seventh card room in Gardena, which led to another ballot measure to ban card rooms and made somebody so angry that at 11.30 p.m. on March 22, 1960, some anonymous anti-gambling radical detonated a bomb inside the Rainbow Club. You are kidding. It blew out eight windows and then two at the Monterey Club next door. It blew apart the bus stop and a car out front. It blew a hole in the Who side of the building. Who hates gambling that much? And it ruptured the security guard's eardrums. Oh my God. I mean, there's crazy gangsters. There's also crazy moral people who right. are like, no, nobody will ever yeah. do. Put that money towards the church uh, donation basket. Even after all this, the vote to ban card rooms still failed on that one. This whole ordeal led to a vote in 1962 for Prop E as to whether or not to completely outlaw all forms of poker from LA County that Prim spent thousands of dollars to defeat and he did once again. It lost by almost double the vote. Jeez. So Prim and the other goons kept every single attempt to ban card rooms at bay for over another decade, but they didn't anticipate card rooms becoming more legal. They weren't prepared for oh. that. In 1978, Prop 13 was passed, which lowered taxes on real estate and that loss of income threw a lot of cities in California into debt. What that meant to several cities in LA County surrounding Gardena was that they saw how much money those card rooms rooms were bringing in in Gardena and they could see no other way of making up for their new loss of income than legalizing card rooms themselves within right. their own city limits and cashing in just like Gardena had done. What year is this? Sorry. 1978. This okay. is like late. this crazy stuff that we've been talking about since the eight, late 1800s was still going on in the 40 19th. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> in 1980, the 40 year reign Gardena monopoly over gambling in LA County ended when the California Bell card room opened in the Jeez. second city in LA to permit legal poker bell. It had 60 tables, which was much bigger than the ones in Gardena, and soon came rooms in Commerce, Huntington Park, and Bell Gardens that were bigger and newer and counterintuitive to the cities I just mentioned, much nicer. A bicycle casino seems pretty nice. Yeah. I'm sure it's not, but that's yeah, one of but them. it looks nice from the outside. <laughs> Everything else is just small it, around it. So There's lights little... on the outside of it. That's pretty nice. Mm, look at that. They had better security, which was important, yeah. and they had higher stakes games, and most importantly, they served alcohol. So very quickly, the Gardena card room empire, which 
was entirely older and smaller card rooms came tumbling down. Yeah. Also in the 80s and 90s, the demographic of this whole part of town became much more Asian and mm -hmm. these newer rooms accommodated that in terms of style and food they right. offered and also the games they had when Gao started to take over from poker. Gao poker was actually invented at the Bell Card Room in 1984. What, really? Then in 1986, California legalized Texas Hold'em and Seven Card Stud, which is so weird that this happened in the 80s yeah. that like these old cowboy rules are finally getting <laughs> overturned. <laughs> That's how long it took to get to it, to the 100 years. <laughs> so that brought even more people into town to play cards and they didn't want to go to the 40-year-old smelly rooms in Gardena. They wanted to go to these new places yeah. in Bell. So in 1980, the Monterey Club closed. The Rainbow Club closed in 1983. The New Gardena closed in Jeez. 1984. The Horseshoe in 1989. And then the El Dorado later in 1996. Wow. And since Prim and the gang had arranged it so that card rooms were the only industry in Gardena, it was like when you only plant one type of corn and then there's like a corn virus and you have no corn because there's no diversification. Same thing in Gardena. When the card rooms left, all the other businesses failed Jeez. because they were depended on the card rooms. Yeah. And there wasn't like restaurants. There's not department stores. There was nothing. Yeah. So Gardena fell on some really hard times and had kind of nothing to offer in terms yeah. of making money at all. Not that Prim cared though. He was mostly out of the Gardena game and had been focusing his energy on a new casino he built called Whiskey Pete's in Nevada along the One California Botto. favorite. The Botto, California border in a town that is now called Prim. That's the casino that has the Bonnie and Clyde car on display. It is. Yeah. <laughs> is it Whiskey? Yeah, Whiskey Pete's. Whiskey Pete's. What's the one across the street that also looks like it should be called Whiskey Pete's? Um, Vodka John's. Buffalo Bills. I think uh, Buffalo Bills has the Bonnie and Clyde car and... No, Whiskey Pete's has the Bonnie and Clyde car. You, you want to shoot me over it? <laughs> Draw. <laughs> I'll see you in the middle of the street at noon. Bring your PS4 controller. We're going to play Red Dead Redemption <laughs> until one of us loses. So after the El Dorado closed in 1996 in Gardena, the Normandy was the only card room left in Gardena Jeez. and things were no longer prim, but grim. So grim that the guy they came to see as their savior was Larry Flint. Oh, This is the man right. they all looked to. In 1998, he bought the land that the El Dorado had been on and on top of it on August 22nd, 2000, Larry Flint brought new life into Gardena like a certain pill a lot of his fans take <laughs> by opening up the Hustler Casino. If you find yourself at a Hustler Casino for more than four hours, you might want to call a doctor. <laughs> That's all I got. to See if he'll let you borrow any money. Call a doctor because they're rich. <laughs> then in 2016, when the Normandy Casino, which had moved to its current location at Rosecrans in Vermont in 1980, had its owners admit to money laundering, it had to be sold within 120 days and Larry Flint swooped in on that and turned that into what we now know it as the Lucky Lady. Okay. That was the famous Normandy Casino. Cool, okay. So nowadays, the only remnants of Gardena's long, and I'm not going to use the word proud legacy, are the Hustler Casino and the Lucky Lady, which are the only two card rooms left in Gardena. Countywide, you've also got the Bicycle Casino mm -hmm. in Bell Gardens, which was taken by the feds in 1990 for having been built with laundered drug money. Cool. The Commerce Casino, yes. Crystal Park Casino in Compton, Hollywood Park Casino yes. in Inglewood, which used to be part of where I won my horses. <laughs> um, and the biggest one in all of LA County where you pretended to be an erupting volcano right. in our video, which you should all watch on YouTube, yes. the Gardens Casino in Hawaiian Gardens, which brings in 70% of Hawaiian Gardens money. Really? They make 70% They of their wouldn't money. let me spend my money there because I wanted to go pee and they were like, do you have any idea? And I only had my passport at the time. So I showed it to them. They're like, this is expired. I'm like, no, that's when I got it. And he, he wouldn't listen to me. That's so, he saw you as the You're shark a reporter, that you yeah. <laughs> so next time you go to that part of town to lose it all on Pi Gow, just remember that the money you lose might be going towards a good cause or maybe not. <laughs>